a little bit of time on uh, learning about uh, investing with regard to our lives. Not, uh, not money necessarily, but it's part of the three T's, the time, talent, and treasure uh, that God has given to us to use for Him. And uh, one verse we're going to start with uh, in uh, Paul's writings, then we're going to go back to a kingdom portion by way of principle. Uh, so in verse number 10 of Ephesians chapter 2, it says, we are His workmanship. Now, uh, this means that God is doing something with regard to us. Uh, he wants to make us ornaments. There's an ornamentation here. Uh, we are diamonds in the rough in this life, and He's looking toward uh, giving us facets and polishing us up and setting us against the backdrop of the universe and uh, allowing us then to shine for Him as trophies of His grace. But uh, this verse always, uh, or also rather, uh, tells us that we are not only an ornamentation, but we are instrumentation. Note what the rest of it says. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Uh, so God wants us on the one hand to shine for Him uh, and uh, let others see what His uh, superabounding grace can do uh, in, in one sense, in a positional sense, but on the other hand, he wants us to note it in an experiential sense. What has grace done for us in our lives? Which means, once we're saved, what are we doing with our lives to glorify Him? Because that's what the verse says, we're created in Christ Jesus. And remember, um, in verse uh, 3 of chapter 1, it tells us that we were blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So on the one hand, that is the ornamentation. But then when we come to chapter 2, there is the practical sense, the experiential sense, where God wants us in time to be instrumental in serving Him. Now that takes, as we have learned before, uh, the process of accumulating doctrine, uh, understanding it, and applying it correctly. Now we are created unto good works. Works do not save us, but works are part of the Christian way of life subsequently. Now, mind you, immediately when you think of works, uh, the, the common things that come about, to, you know, serving the poor and doing this. And though that might be part of it, of course, uh, sometimes helping a neighbor in a distress, uh, sometimes doing things for other people. Uh, mainly, these good works, uh, the Greek says, it's works from the source of good. That's two things. One, the filling of the Holy Spirit. And secondly, is Bible doctrine that has been metabolized and become part of your human spirit. So we're created to do works from the source of good. And that means uh, the, the reservoir of doctrine that we have in our soul. Note the last part of this verse. Which God hath before ordained. Uh, he has preordained them. He has set them aside as something that He wants to incorporate in uh, His will for us, that we should walk in them. So once we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, uh, there's something more that we're supposed to do. In Him we're supposed to become what God wants us to be and to begin investing our life uh, for his overall cause. Now let's go back to Matthew chapter 25. And this is very definitely a kingdom passage. But as we go through it, you will see that there are some transdispensational principles that um, uh, apply to us today that, in fact, are very, very important. Verse number 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling in a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. Now, the first thing, of course, we have the setting. Uh, Jesus Christ ascended, and he's going to be missing from the earth as Israel's great commission is going to be proclaimed. But then, as you know, that didn't come to pass as yet. We have the Grace Commission. 
But Jesus Christ came down and he charged uh, the Apostle Paul with another message, uh, with another strategy to go and reach the world. And then he went back to sit on the right hand of the Father. So in both cases, there's a similarity. Christ is missing, but his servants have been put in charge. And that's what this verse uh, says. The, the man, the, the master, uh, the owner of the property, the one in authority, has gone on this journey to a far country. But before he left, he called his servants. Now the word uh, servant there means uh, one that is under another's uh, employ, uh, one who has been uh, called upon to do a certain thing uh, for an authority, uh, one who serves another. In fact, one who is owned by another. And many of the uh, ancient servants uh, were owned by their masters. But note the um, ownership here with regard to the property. And that's the first thing we want to note, that this particular portion of Scripture teaches us, by way of typology, that everything is owned by God and belongs to Him. Uh, he delivered unto them, note, His goods. If you'll come down here to verse number 27. It says, My money, and that I should have received mine own with interest. So the Lord Jesus Christ here is uh, the, the master, and we are the servants in the story and in the symbolism. But what has Jesus Christ done? The first thing that he has done is he has given us uh, two things, and it's going to be part of the, the story that we're going to see. The first is he has given us ability. The second thing he's going to give us capability. Uh, you have to have both. Uh, if you have ability without capability to, to utilize these abilities, uh, you'll never be able to, to do what uh, you're supposed to do for the Lord. On the other hand, if you have capability and no ability, uh, it's meaningless as well. You've got money in the bank, but it serves no purpose. It does no good. You've got to have both. Uh, and you'll see that Jesus Christ is going to give, uh, in the story here, these men, these servants, both, uh, and both are uh, called upon to do certain things. Now, if you hold your place here and come to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 14, you'll see that the Apostle Paul uses this concept of divine ownership of all things to witness to others. That's something I want us to be reminded of because oftentimes we get to thinking that our possessions are our own. We need to be reminded of Dottie Rambo's song which says, The things that I love and hold dear to my heart are just borrowed, they're not mine at all. You say, that's right, the bank owns it. Well, that's uh, partially true as well. But in actuality, unless the Lord uh, made them and gave them to you, you would not have them. So it uh, uh, says here in verse number 17 of Acts 14, Nevertheless, God left himself not without witness, in that he did good, and gave us rain from heaven, fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. He is reminding them uh, where their blessings come from, the, the source of, of everything that they enjoy in life, and that's God himself. That in actuality, if he did not give them, they would not have them because he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine. And so they needed to be reminded of this because their idols uh, tended to uh, make them think that, um, uh, that there are other gods and other ways to make them prosperous and wealthy. And Paul reminds them it's God. In chapter 17 of Acts, he does the very same thing. Verse number 25, God is not worshiped with men's hands as though he needs anything, seeing he gives to all life and breath and all things. Now, why does he do this? Even though he owns them, why does he share them even with unbelieving people? Some uh, of which are God haters and very nasty and cruel to him and to his children. 
Verse number 27, that they should seek the Lord. See, he used it as a soul winning tool. If happily they might feel after him and find him, even though he be not far from every one of us. So the uh, coming back to our story here, with regard to us, we need to be reminded of these very same things. What God gives us, He owns. He just lets them, uh, lets us borrow them in order to uh, have a blessing ourselves and to use them for His honor and glory. Now we're going to go from ownership here to the allocation of the goods. Verse number 15. Before He left, this is Matthew 25, Unto one he gave five talents, unto another two, and unto another one. Now the talents represent capability. Here is, here is money, but it, it, can be, it can be anything that uh, he gives so that abilities can be utilized. You see, the two come together to be developed. Uh, one without the other, uh, they cannot re really be used properly. You have to have both ability and capability, uh, means and, and methods to, to uh, make things happen. So that's what it says. One guy got the five talents, the other got two, and the other one. To every man according to his several ability. So God allocated these things in accordance with uh, ability. Uh, if he gave a, a man of great ability uh, less than proper capability, this man couldn't carry out his function. If he gave a man of lesser capability, I mean ability, more capability, he would be crushed from under the weight because he wouldn't have the wherewithal to know how to develop it. So each in accordance with his own ability, he gave capability. Uh, he is not asking us to do... Uh, um, Something uh, wherewith he is not going to provide the means. Now, uh, if you'll hold your place here and turn to the book of Romans, Paul talks about this as well. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 4, and we'll start reading on down. God has done the very same thing for us. For as we have many members in one body, all members don't have the same office. So we being many are one body in Christ and every one members one of another. However, it then says, having gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. So uh, each of us has the abilities and then, of course, uh, by grace, we have the capability. Uh, we do not believe, of course, in what's called spiritual gifts anymore. Those things passed off the scene. There's no such thing as the spiritual gifts mentioned in Corinthians and so forth. However, there are gifts. They are latent gifts, inherent gifts that we all have by way of natural talents and abilities. And we could go around the room right here and point out strengths of personality, strengths of, of work and, and so forth that each of us has that's different than the other. Uh, and yet uh, we shine in these particular areas. Not everybody is a pastor, but doesn't have to be. Uh, you can work according to your ability where you you are and by God's grace utilize that for his glory and that's what this is, uh, is talking about ability and capability putting them both together and investing it investing your life your time your talents and treasure for him so let's come on back here and verse number 16 we're in Matthew 25 16 note that for two of these servants, the giving of capability in accordance with their ability was not misplaced. They were counted faithful of the Lord. They were entrusted with something, uh, and he wanted them to carry it out. But no, unto the one he gave five, or excuse me, verse 16, then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. 
five and five, even in new math, <laughs> is ten. He, he increased. Uh, he doubled his money. He did something more with what the Lord had given him than just uh, maintaining the status quo or uh, horror of horrors, losing money. Uh, he went out and did something with it so that he doubled the efforts uh, that um, uh, his, his Lord, or that, uh, his Lord uh, gave to him. Note verse 17. Likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. So in both situations, Though both men had different abilities and capabilities, uh, uh, each having different portions, yet the proportion was the same with regard to the end result. They both doubled their money. Now, let's move on down here. But he that received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. Uh, not a wise move. Why did he do this? If you'll come on down to, uh, to verse number 24, we'll see. And this, of course, is a common problem even for us. Why did this man do this? Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee, that thou art an hard man, reaping where you hast not sown, gathering where thou hast uh, not straw. Now he knew that. He knew that the Lord was going to call him into account. He knew that the Lord was coming back. How do we know that? If you come back up here to, to verse number 19. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. What have you done with the capability I gave you? Now, uh, explain this uh, to me. Uh, what should I do? Praise you or punish you? Now, the others, knowing that the Lord was going to return and that there would be this day of reckoning, immediately went out and began investing it to double their money, uh, to serve their Lord acceptably and well. The other guy went, and the implication is immediately. He went out and, and dug a hole and hid uh, the money. It's a good thing uh, someone else, uh, a robber, wasn't uh, watching him because he'd have dug it up and stolen it. But here's the reason why. Even though he knew he was going to have to give an account, he did not use what God gave him. Verse 25. Because I was afraid, and I went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. Fear. Now, who was he more afraid of? Who did he fear? wasn't his master. Even though he knew his master was a hard man and there would be a day of reckoning, he did not fear his master more than he feared others and what they would think of him. Because he knew the master was coming back. But what did he do? Instead of doing that, he feared to invest what his master had given him for his glory, his interest, his gain, his own. Uh, and instead, he went and hid it because of, well, he didn't want uh, somebody else. He feared men more than his master. Now, let's just think about that in light of what's going to happen to us. Book of Romans chapter 14. Book of Romans chapter 14. Now, probably, there are many, say, even in our own church, and I'm just giving this as a hypothetical situation. They have the ability to get here on a Wednesday night. They got cars, they got gas, they got job, and so forth. Uh, and uh, uh, they have the capability, excuse me, they have the ability to get here. There's, there's nothing wrong with their health. They have the time. They have the capability to be here. But instead, it's for another reason they're not here. Uh, be that as it may, they've got something else to do. In this man's case, it was fear of what others would think of him. But uh, whatever uh, uh, we could list there, it's something keeping them 
from doing what God wants them to do by putting together ability and capability in order to serve the Lord, say, by being faithful to a local church. And you know what they don't do? They don't fear the Lord. There's no fear of God for their eyes. Uh, they don't care that there's going to come a day of reckoning. They're more interested either in their own pleasure or what someone else is going to think of them if they're faithful to church and, and it's going to cause uh, problems in the family and so forth. But uh, instead, they fear man or they fear that they're not going to get their just due of time or pleasure uh, and they don't fear the Lord. Come to chapter 14 of Romans, verse 11, or verse 10 rather. Last part, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Ask myself the question. Here, here was a, two guys who had what God uh, gave them, abilities, He gave them capability, and they immediately went out and used it faithfully. Well done, the Lord says, thou good and faithful servant. I've given you these things, and now I'm going to reward you with even more. Uh, but the other guy, uh, he didn't do anything because he feared. Not his master and the day of reckoning, but feared what others would think. I wonder what's keeping them from doing God's will. I you just can't understand it. We're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And for some reason they do not fear that they're going to enter eternity from that point onward suffering loss. They could have had more, but they're not going to get more because they wanted this world and uh, the favors of this world more than pleasing their master. For it's written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So that every one of us is going to give an account to God. There's a day of reckoning coming. Now what are we going to do? Oh, regardless if we have five talents or two talents, uh, God's going to give us the capability to use them for Him. Uh, immediately, like these others too, to be good and faithful, we need to be busy. We need to be working and doing and developing these things. But we can be like the other guy. Uh, more, more fearful of, of life than fearful of the master. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Here was Paul's attitude with regard to these things. Verse 9, wherefore we labor. Uh, sometimes you get uh, the idea that, uh, that Paul understood these concepts so much that, that he uh, uh, he never took a break, that he broke down before taking a break and, and getting refreshed to go out in, in the ministry. Uh, he certainly was a, a busy man. Therefore we labor that whether present or absent, we might be accepted of him. You see, the guys with the, uh, uh, the five and the two talents did something so that they would be in the, in the final analysis accepted of the Lord when he finally came to reckon with them. Look, I gave you these things. What did you do with them? Explain yourself. And so that's why he says, we're going to appear, verse 10, the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone might receive the things done in his body according to that which he has done, whether good or bad. It's either going to be well done or we're going to see the alternative here in just a little bit. Good or bad means gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, and stubble. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and take a look at the judgment seat. The wood, hay, and stubble represents a misuse of time, a misuse of talent, a misuse of treasure. It's all mine, mine, mine. It's my time. I'm going to do what I want to with it. I'm going to go here, go there, do the other, but not invest it in God's will. It's my talent. I'm going to develop it to get more, to get friends, prestige, more money, and so forth. But I'm not going to give any of that to God. It's my treasure, not His. But it says, verse 13, the day is going to declare it because it's going to be revealed by fire, tested by fire, of what sort it is. Based on that, if it abides, the man will receive a reward. If not, the work shall be burned. Life's work. 
where instead of, of, of saying, boy, I'm going to utilize this so that before my God, my Savior and all else, um, at this day of reckoning, there is going to be praise for my Savior and reward for my future. It is not investing that. And what's going to happen? It shall be burned and he will suffer loss. Now, not the loss of his salvation, but yet so as by fire. Everything else, basically, is going to be taken from him except his salvation. It's all going to go up in smoke. It's all going to be burned at that, at that time. And he's going to enter eternity. Well, having had the abilities and capabilities undeveloped, he's going to enter eternity. He had all this on one side, but once he enters into that uh, dimension of life forever, he has virtually nothing but his salvation to show for himself. Okay, let's go back. Now, note what the Lord said to these men after he was reckoning with them. Verse 20, the one that had received the five talents, we're in Matthew 25, 20, said, Lord, you delivered unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. Note, note what he is doing here too. And I, I like this. It's kind of scary for all of us, but I like this. Every tongue shall confess to me. The master came and he didn't tell the servant. The servant told the master, you gave me so much. This is so much I've earned. He gave an account of himself. He told what he did and how it benefited his master. He told of his faithfulness day in and day out to this task of netting for his master more than what his master had given to him. He was faithful and the master recognized it. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter the joy of your Lord. Uh, uh, there is a... A multiplication here of these things. Uh, there is more that you're going to get. Here, here's what you had. You doubled the money. And because of this, I can entrust you even with greater things in the future uh, because of this. This guy with two talents did the very same thing. I have gained two other talents beside them. Well done, thou good and faithful servant, and so forth. But then he comes down here. To the unfaithful servant. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that you were a hard man. He knew something about his master. Now, one thing we ought to know about the Lord Jesus Christ is that he loves two things. Righteousness and justice. And you know what that means? We get exactly what we deserve. He is a hard man to deal with. He is not going to cut any slack. He, he is going to encourage. He's going to give capability. Uh, he's going to honor you for developing what he has given you in accordance and proportion to what you, you have and what he's given. But if, if you don't, that's it. He's a hard man to deal with. And we are going to face a master like that at the Bema seat of Christ. Uh, I knew you reap where you had not sown, you gathered where you have not straw. Uh, in other words, um, he, he was a, a one. And this is the neat thing here. He invested money in others. He invested his own property in others that others might might serve him back twofold here in, in this story. But uh, he uses a, a 30 fold, a 70 fold, 100 fold in other uh, examples. He invested his money where where he had uh, where there was nothing going on. He infused it with his property that he might get something back. And this guy knew that's what the master was about. He wanted to get, in, in the case of Christ, glory for himself, exaltation for himself, faithfulness in his servants, and so forth. But he was afraid, more afraid of others and life than he was of the master. He hid his talent. Now note what he said to this man. Lord, his Lord answered and said, you wicked and slothful servant. Just the opposite of good and faithful wicked and slothful. 
Good means that it's good of intrinsic value. He actually did accomplish something that was going to be lasting. The wicked uh, uh, aspect of it means that he was accomplishing nothing. In fact, it is counterproductive. He is working against God in, in this case, or against the master, and not for him. That's why he's called a wicked servant. And then the slothful servant. Note, if you're not fa faithful, it's not unfaithful, it's slothful. And uh, uh, sloth, and even in the Greek, it means downright lazy. Didn't get up off your backside to, to do what you were supposed to do in investing your time, talents, and treasure to get back more from me and to benefit you. Did not do that. And, and uh, so, it's not uh, good and faithful, it's wicked and slothful. It's counterproductive and non-productive. God wants us to invest our life in these things. We all have abilities, and He, by grace, gives us capability for the purpose of developing them. Now, let's note and see uh, what I believe is going to take place even for us in eternity. Verse 28, and just a little explanation here, a reminder that all Scripture dovetails, and uh, these various principles are, are transdispensational. Remember we talked about Joshua and the spoils of war, where here is one guy uh, fighting against another guy. He kills him, and God gives him that man's property uh, to be part of, part of his own. Okay? Take therefore the talent from him and give it to him. Now note, not with the two talents, but to the ten talents. He gave it to the top guy. Why? Because the top guy could be trusted. You know, the top guy was somebody that was going to see to it in his life that he would be disciplined, he would be organized, he would be productive, and that, that things would uh, be made to happen with regard to what God had, had given him uh, and the interest accrued. And Jesus says in verse 29, For unto everyone that hath shall be given. Now remember, here's five talents made ten talents, and the Lord said you were faithful over these things. I'm going to make you ruler over many things. And he said the very same thing, uh, an exponential thing. It's going to increase. Your faithfulness here and faithfulness here is going to get even uh, more um, reward here because you're trustworthy. What couldn't the Lord do to the man with the one talent? Couldn't trust, you know, couldn't trust him, couldn't reward him. Uh, uh, because he gave him this, and the man would not use it for the master's glory. So, for everyone that hath, it shall be given. And he shall have note in abundance. <laughs> He's going to have more than, than what he had planted. That's a neat thing. You know, I'm not a farmer, but I, I learned this. Um, when, when you plant uh, a seed, you always get what uh, in the end when it comes up and you, you have more seeds than the one that you planted. There's always a multiplication of the seed in the plant. All right? Reminds me of an apple thing. What's it say that anyone can count the seeds in the apple, but only God can count the apples in the seed? Okay? Going to think about that. Think about Take it home. It'll cause you to sleep tonight if you ponder long enough. Anyone can count the seeds in an apple, but only God can count the apples in a seed. Okay. For unto everyone that hath shall be given, he shall have an abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. Non-productive people. By the way, think about it. If God is going to apportion eternity and the possessions of eternity uh, to people there, they have to be faithful people. And uh, since he has so many people that are working for these various uh, possessions here, uh, if somebody forfeits their possessions because they did not develop them in time, they still have to be owned by somebody. Who's he going to give them to? Faithful people. It's a forfeiture, in my opinion, it's a forfeiture of what they could have had and could have been 
in eternity future, but instead they forfeit it, but it's still out there for somebody. Who's it going to be given to? Well, who was it given to here? To everyone that has shall be given and shall, be, uh, and shall have in abundance. In other words, he's going to have more from the person who was unfaithful. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which you have. And he took it away and gave it to the most faithful, most productive person uh, that he had. And then lastly, it says here, And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Of course, um, that won't happen to us. But you understand this is the, this is the kingdom uh, program of mandatory bankruptcy. And that's actually what this particular uh, parable is. And so the guy loses his soul because he didn't give of his money, he didn't give of his means to develop it for uh, the kingdom and so forth. Now, let's go to Luke chapter 12 for our final portion of Scripture. Now, hopefully, you'll, you'll understand the principle here. If you don't use it, you'll what? Lose it. And you know what? thing scares me <laughs> is that what I lose here is going to be given to somebody who doesn't like me or something, who got on fire for the Lord and all of a sudden I said, wait one second, then <laughs> uh, what? I thought I heard always here. Okay, so if you don't use it, you'll lose it. But if you do use it, you'll be compensated in abundance so that if they lose it, you potentially stand to gain what they had. Now, of course, we're not wishing that anybody lose their rewards, but if they're going to do it because they are wicked and slothful, non-productive uh, and counterproductive, or vice versa there, um, if that's going to happen, you stay true. That gives even more motivation because you're going to receive an abundance from, from these people what they could have had. If they don't want it, that's fine. I'll tell you what, we should say well, we want it. Uh, not because of we're greedy or selfish, but simply because that means that if God gives it to us, He counts us worthy. He counts us trustworthy to be handed uh, these greater responsibilities in eternity future. And that is an honor which brings Him glory. Verse 16 of Luke 12. We're almost done here. He spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? Pine, talent, and treasure. They all began to, to accrue. There's nothing wrong, of course, and we're not saying there's something wrong with, with earning money or having things or using uh, things for, for one's own pleasure. That's not what we're talking about. But this parable, as well as the other, is that, is that we have these things and they're used simply for us and they're undeveloped for God and His cause. So, he thought within himself, what am I going to do? I have no room where to bestow my fruits. This will I do. I'll pull down my barns and build greater. Time, talent, treasure accruing to this guy, utilizing it all. And he keeps building up these great uh, uh, riches, uh, piling up so high he's got to build a greater storage area for it. There I'll bestow all my fruits and goods. I'll say to my soul, soul, you have much goods laid up for you for many years. See, he forgets that the day of reckoning is coming. He forgets that he may not have a tomorrow. He forgets that he's going to be brought into the presence of the master real soon. It is inevitable. Sooner or later, the master is going to return from his journey. Sooner or later, you're going to be brought face to face with the guy whose goods you have uh, and you're to develop. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, and I believe he's saying, saying it to us all, and especially those of our church who, who know better, who should be faithful, who should be regular, and so forth. 
thou fool. It's idiocy. You're a fool. This night your soul is going to be required of thee. Even or then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? Uh, again, to die a millionaire is not a blessing. To die with, with, a, with money in the bank is not a blessing. How much did you leave? You left it all. And if you died, uh, what I'm talking about is dying, a million, being a millionaire, and having not used any of your life and means for God is foolish. It is sheer stupidity. This night thy soul is going to be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which you have provided? You have had a lot in this life, but nothing devoted to God. You had a lot in this life, but nothing developed for God. Uh, you, you were a steward of his goods, but you were unfaithful and lazy for him, and that nothing accrued uh, to his interest. Verse 21, So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. God gives ability and capability. Uh, the, the men in our story had both and used it for their master. The other wasted it away for whatever reason and ended up having nothing. Christ was dishonored, the master was dishonored, Christ is dishonored, and uh, we are more or less disenfranchised from having anything in the future.